participants please switch on your camera yeah let us see the participants once Good morning, Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Hinder, sir. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, fine, sir. Good. Bit cold in Hyderabad. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good morning. This time Bombay is also experiencing very good cold. Okay. Climate change. Hmm? Yeah, climate change. Uh, Dr. Madhav, Suraj, Pradhan, Sandeep, just put on your camera so that we can take snap of today's program. Ami, Ankita, I think these people are daily. Yeah, good to see some participants doing the microbiology work. Good morning, Han, good morning. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, doctor. Good morning, sir. So today is the last day of this training program and uh, all the participants are requested after this completion of these two sessions uh, you need to fill up the post evaluation training uh, form as well as the feedback form so both the forms are uh, essential and that's why today's your attendance is compulsory for both the uh, uh, sessions so here now uh, today uh, for this uh, 10 days training program and the last day today we have two eminent speakers first speaker dr navina sir he is uh, working as principal scientist at I icr nrc uh, on meat at Hyderabad, and Sir is going to speak on role of FSSI uh, regulations uh, and establishment for production of meat and meat products. 
and uh, the last speaker is Dr. Suman Talukdar, and he is working as senior scientist at uh, Division of Livestock Products and Technology at IVRI, ICR, IVRI, because Dr. B. Sunyutar, uh, he got operated for angioplasty, so that's why we, we, we have changed the speaker. So now, uh, and Dr. Suman, he is going to speak on suitable measures for economic utilization of slaughter of waste. So now I request our PI and Professor Dr. R.J. Jhende, sir, to give brief introduction about uh, the first speaker. Jhende, sir, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vidya. Uh, good morning and welcome all the participants for the today's last day of our uh, 10 days uh, national e-training program on the quality assurance, uh, advances in quality assurance and production of the hygienic uh, animal virgin foods. Uh, Today uh, we have, uh, as uh, Dr. Vaidya said, uh, to uh, expertise uh, people in the area of the, uh, the regulations and also the, the solid waste disposal and utilization of the, the byproducts. Uh, first speaker, I am happy to introduce him as uh, he is well known in the APCC also and he is working since uh, I think 2013 14. Uh, and until date, he is there in the various scientific panel to guide uh, and to develop certain standards for the industries. Uh, I have pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Navina. Uh, he is a principal scientist presently at the ICR NRC Meet, Hyderabad. He did his uh, graduation from the Darwa uh, University of Agriculture as an uh, Bachelor of Veterinary Science, and after that, post graduation and PhD in Premium Institute like uh, IVRI, Izzat Nagar. And after that, he did uh, two postdoc in the USA in 2018 and 19. And after that, he joined as a scientist through ARS in, in ICR centers. He worked as a NRC in, uh, from 2012 uh, to uh, 11 to 12 that become the scientist there itself and still is working as a principal uh, scientist uh, till date on the NRC meet uh, Hyderabad. His field of specialization mainly uh, in, in the area of the proteomics and the meat quality, the meat authentication and the uh, what are the adulteration, how it happens into the meat and meat products. So he has developed many techniques based on the PCR and also other uh, serological techniques for the identification of the adulteration of meat, their authentication, the speciation, you can say, and uh, we can prevent how the help of the uh, health of the common consumers. He has also expertise in the food safety management systems, entrepreneurship development, consultancy, and the contract research projects with the industries. The important projects he has handled there are so far, he has completed the successfully six projects which are mainly sponsored by the DBT, then ICR, then DST, and also the, the, he is also the one of the PI in the industry related project that is on the characterization and evaluation of the natural antioxidants extracted from the different spices in the ground chicken and pork. He has a recipient of the mini awards. To name some, he is also the fellow of National Academy of Agriculture Science. It is very reputed uh, fellow award in 2021 recently he got it so i congratulate on behalf of me and all the participant dr navina thank you sir. then uh, national contact person uh, i commenced uh, since uh, 2010 is also the scientific panel member on the fssi of the meat and meat product and uh, other scientific panel uh, in the fssi is a fellow of the imsa that is indian association of meat science in 2018, IPSA in 2017, NABA in 2018, I buy uh, cast fellow in 2008. He's also the editor of Journal of Mid Science uh, since 2017. Recently, the, uh, he has published so far uh, the publications at his credit. There are total research paper is over 65. There is international papers and Scopus citation was 1,650 and the age index is about 21. 
so he has good track record of the research and the publications and also the industrial uh, very good linkage and guiding continuously on on base of the uh, abcs and other other quality matters which are dealing this uh, industries across the india and also the periphery of the hyderabad dr navin today he will speak on the role of abcs in the registration of the any food establishment for production of the meat and meat products for the information to the navina the, the, the participants we have here today and for the 10 days so these are the, the pg phd students uh, of vp lpd and other related the subjects then faculties of our uh, university even the other universities across the country and the industry people those who are mainly involved in production of the meat dairy and also the fish so the, the dr navin is a very right person to speak about the role of abcs in registration of any food establishment for the production of the meat and meat product okay so i invite dr navina to speak on this topic so dr navina please thank you uh, gande sir am i audible sir is my voice clear yes yeah yes 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 okay so thank you very much uh, for the invitation to interact with the, all the participants so uh, when when dr gande sir has invited me to speak about the fssai so i said sir i am not the right person probably you need to invite someone directly from the fssai because i have been associated with fssai for the last uh, maybe 7 8 years so based on my experience i will be talking not just fssai about the global food safety regulations and what are the legislations or act or the rules uh, about the food safety in india so i will be touching But many points dr navina uh, one minute yeah. for the information to the all the participants dr navina was uh, selected for the advisor in the fssi but uh, is instructed he is not allowed to join the fssi so uh, you cannot say like you are the not right person but you are the right person to speak about this fssi thank you okay, thank, thank you sir uh, yeah thank you thank you sir and also thanks to dr shukla congratulations sir coordinating so nice to see a large number of participants sir especially the blend of youngsters and also very senior people actually i could able to see some very senior people especially from the joining from the industries so wonderful wonderful to interact always with the people from industry academia the students so very right platform so i definitely look forward to have a great interaction so maybe uh, some information maybe a reputation especially for those people from industries so you will you will be familiar with the many of the areas which i am going to talk so but they, it may be of, uh, very significantly useful to the students what i feel so pardon me if uh, some slides may be a reputation for you or you already aware of certain topics what i speak so i am i am going to share my slides sir with this uh, brief introduction so slides are visible sir gende sir yes sir yes sir okay good so welcome once again uh, to my presentation and i will be speaking on indian food legislations and role of fssai in ensuring food safety it's not just fssai i will be touching a uh, different areas so what is the position globally who draft the rules who make the rules and what are the regulations which are available first before we speak about the regulations in india so what is the status which is happening globally Okay, whether slides are moving, sir? Then, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Visible, visible, sir. Okay, fine. So, when we talk of food safety globally, there are two agencies. I'm sure all of you must be aware of Food and Agriculture Organization, located in Rome, in Italy, and we also have a World Health Organization, located in Geneva. So, the FAO work towards ensuring the nutritional security. whereas who is working towards ensuring the safety to the public so these are two governmental bodies and they together constitutes a codex alimentarius commission cac a codex alimentarius commission is a international food standards body so constituted jointly by fao and who the codex is an agency which makes standards for food and food products 
So parallelly, we have other agencies like OIE. I'm sure all the veterinarians and many of you must be aware the OIE. It is a World Organization for Animal Health. Whereas the Codex looks after standards for the food and food products. The OIE it is the one which takes care of animal health, whether it's animal and poultry health, the welfare is looked after by the World Organization for Animals, that is OIE. And apparently we have International Plant Protection Convention. So they make standards for anything related to the plants or plant health. So we have a plant health, animal health, and the food products and the food standards. So these are almost parallel bodies located in different places. So OIE is located at Paris in France. IPPC is located in Rome, Italy. Again, the Codex Elementary is headquarters at Rome, Italy. So the Codex was a bit old. It was constituted almost in 1963. The Codex standards, whatever the standards they make for food, meat, poultry, egg, milk, whatever the commodities may be, these standards are used by World Trade Organization. The WTO is established in almost 1995. They are using these codex standards to regulate the trade between the countries around the world. So when we say WTO, there are two items within this. There is called SPS, sanitary and phytosanitary and technical barrier to trade. I'm sure many of you might be aware, just for the benefit of the students, so what is the sanitary and phytosanitary? Because very often you will be using in your course curriculum and people when, when they speak, they speak, when they speak about the food safety, they use these words sanitary, phytosanitary. So that is the plant health and animal and the human health, sanitary and the phytosanitary. And we also have TBT, that is technical barriers to trade. So what is it? What is it technical barriers to trade? I think. So I'm just, I would like to give one example. When we expected that the American chicken is going to come to India. So as a part of the members and as a part of different committees. So we just wanted to stop the import of American chicken to the India. So we thought of giving some technical barrier to the trade. We gave a reason that the American chickens were fed with a meat and bone meal derived from beef. So the Ameri since the American chicken were fed with the meat and bone meal derived from the beef, we cannot import the chicken to the India. That is the reason we gave actually. Because India, the consumption of beef has a lot of uh, sen 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 I mean, uh, sensitivities. So we cannot import chicken from the USA because they are fed with their beef and bone meal from beef actually. So then the WTO has a dispute panel. They have a dispute settlement panel. The US went to the WTO dispute panel saying that India cannot give the reason for not importing their chicken, saying that our birds are fed with the beef derived meat and bone meal. Of course, somehow they won the case. Still, we did not get much of chicken from the US. We had a lot of apprehensions that once the American chicken comes, our poultry industry will face a lot of so just to give an example, what is this TBT? Now, if the China want to stop import of American pork or European pork to the China, they put a lot of import duties on the product. So it is again a TBT issue. There are various reasons, various uh, issues where people use these SPS. If the developed countries, if they want to stop importing uh, any food or any other uh, meat or uh, milk, anything from the developing countries or maybe India, they use the SPS measures. They say that your product need to have an antibiotic residue below this MRL, maximum residue, maximum residue limit. Or they may say it must be free from FMD, free from all these things. So they use the SPS. So SPS and TBT are being used by different nations for regulation of the trade. Now we have almost 185 countries who are the members of WTO. All these 185 countries are members of WTO. These countries need to be abided by the WTO regulations. Now, as per the SPS and TBT agreement, it requires that national standards to be harmonized with international standards. So whatever the standards we have in India or we have developed in India, they need to be integrated with the international standards. When we say international standards, they are nothing but a codex standards. Of course, we also have the European standards, but internationally, the codex standards are widely accepted and they are used by the WTO for regulation of the trade. So in simple sense, whatever the standards we develop in India, they need to be integrated or harmonized with the codex standards. So this is a basic information. I hope all of you should know it actually. So when we say globally, there are different agencies. 
like United States Food and Drug Administration, which is almost equivalent to the FSSAI, what we have in India. The US FDA regulate, they draft standards for almost all the food products in the USA. But it, when it comes to meat, poultry, and egg, technically the standards are regulated by, are drafted by United States Department of Agriculture, USDA. So they have FDA, they have USDA, the role is same. Only thing is the USDA look after the meat, poultry, and egg. In the Europe, we have a similar agency called European Food Safety Authority. So they draft the standards, but whatever the standards, they need to be harmonized with the codex standards, which are uh, global standards. So it is brief about the WTO and international standard setting bodies. Even in, the, in India now, the food safety ecosystem is changing because there is there is a paradigm shift occurring happening inside the food industry because till now people are bothering about the food quality. In the beginning, people were bothered about the food quality. And after that, we were bothering about the nutritional aspect. Now, especially with pandemics and all, people are more concerned about the safety. At the same time, we have regulatory agencies like FSSAI, so who are regulating this. So all these are changing the food safety ecosystem in India also. And again, they are part of the WTO, India is signatory of the WTO. We have customer requirement. We have regulatory bodies. We need to abide by FAO WHO codex standards. And also, if we want access to the developed countries, if we want to export our product to the developed countries, we need to abide by, we need to be on par with the USDA, USFDR, European standards. And at the same time, we also have retailers and the private labels. So this is how the food safety ecosystem is changing in India. So now, in order to meet all these demands, in order to meet the global standard, we need to harmonize, we need to standardize our own standards within the country. In food and agriculture, when it comes to food and agriculture sector, there are a number of organizations responsible for formulation of standards and monitoring of their quality. So before the initiation, before the beginning of the FSA, we had various standards, various acts, orders. We had Prevention of Food Adulteration Act. When we were studying BBSE, we used to read about the PFA Act, which was formulated in 1954. Essential Commodities Act, Environmental Protection Act, Insecticide Act, Agriculture Produce Act, Bureau of Indian Standards, Export Act, Fruits and Vegetable Order. We used to read about Meat Food Products Order, Milk and Milk Products Order. So most of these acts and orders were distributed in different ministries. There are different agencies regulating these. So it has become difficult for us to meet the international standards when these were there. So that's the reason the government thought of having a one agency, one department who regulate the safety of the food. So that has resulted in enactment of Food Safety and Standards Act. The government of India has passed this FSS Act in the year 2006. It was passed in Indian uh, Gazette and the, it, it has become a Food Safety and Standards Act since 2006. After this, in the year 2008, the government and the Ministry of Health and Family Affairs they established the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. All the existing act, regulations, rules were combined and they brought under the FSSAI with an objective to lay down science-based standards for articles of food to regulate their manufacture, storage, distribution, sale and import. Please note that the import of food is regulated by the FSSAI, but not the export. When it comes to export, we have different agencies like APEDA, MPEDA, that is Marine Product Development Authority. We have Export Inspection of Council, EIC. They are the one which regulates the export. But when it comes to the import, it is looked after by the FSCI. And also to ensure availability of safe and wholesome food for human consumption. So in the latest slides, I will be explaining how the FSCI will draft the standards, how they monitor how they do the surveillance, how the food safety is ensured around the country. So we'll see those aspects in the later slide. So before we go to uh, those details, I just want to say when the FSSAI was established in 2008, they drafted various standards, they came out with various regulations. What happened is repeal of act, all the older acts and orders, they were repeat. Earlier we had this PFA 1954, Fruit Products Order 1955, Meat Food Products Order 1973, Vegetable Oil Products, Edible Oil Packaging, all these were abolished. They were brought under FSI. Now, 
we don't have different agencies, different ministry dealing with the food safety. It is only one ministry, Ministry of Health and Family Affairs, with FSCI, please deal with the food safety. All of these acts and orders earlier, whatever days before 2006, they were repealed and they were brought under FSCI. And then, what are the new provisions under this Food Safety and Standards Act? Why it was made? What is the benefit actually? How it is helping to organize the food safety in the country? Because under this new Food Safety and Standards Act, regulation of food imported in the country, it is regulating the importing of the food. Provision of food recall. Now we are talking about the traceability. Food recall is a big issue. So under this FSS Act, there is a provision for the food recall. The surveillance, constant surveillance and monitoring of anything related to the food safety. New enforcement structure envisages large network of food labs. All the laboratories they brought under one framework. New justice dispensation system for fast track disposal of cases. Harmonization of domestic standards with the international food standards covering health foods, supplements, nutraceuticals. I will be I will be telling about these things. Issuing licenses within a time frame of two months. Provision by designated officers. I want all the participants to mute their uh, audio, please. Please, Dr. Mahesh Rajukar, please mute your audio. Then, uh, compensation to victims. Reward to the informer, no license for small food business operator, only registration is mandatory, central licensing from authority. So these were the new provisions made under the Food Safety and Standards Act uh, 2006. So the new act, the rules and regulations, they were brought with it. So between 2008 to 11, a lot of standards have been drafted. And they came out with at least minimum seven regulations were, have been published by the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India in the year 2011. You can see, if you go to the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India website, you will see the different standards related to every commodity. Just click on the Food Safety and Standards Licensing and Registration of Food Business Regulations 2011. So these regulations are already published and approved in the Gazette. Food Safety and Standards, Packaging and Labeling Regulations 2011. Food Safety and Standards, Food Product Standards and Food Additives Regulations 2011. So these were the regulations which are already approved and they were, have been published in the Gazette of India after the establishment of the FSSAI. So, in the standard, I, I, I request the host to please mute all the participants actually. Dr. Mahesh Rajivka, please mute your audio. Okay, so in addition to the FSSA standard, we also have a few voluntary standards which are still being used by different agencies and different commodities. So what are these voluntary standards? So we have two important voluntary standards like Bureau of Indian Standard, BIS, and Directorate of Marketing Inspection, they are called Ogmark Standards. So let us see why and how these standards are being used. So when we say still there is a BIS office, it's a statutory body functioning under the ministry, under the Commerce Ministry actually. The main functions of BIS, the National Standards Organization of India, are formulation of Indian standards for food and food products and their implementation by promotion and through voluntary and third party certification systems. So these standards in general cover raw materials. So you all must know the role of FSSAI starts after harvesting of these food, and pro food products. So FSSA will not make standards for the raw materials. Only when these plants are harvested, then further processing, further formulation, the FSSA comes. Before the harvesting of the these plants or the foods, it is the different agencies who deal with the making standards actually. So the BIS and the ARGMARCs make standards even for the raw materials, permitted and their quality parameters, hygienic conditions of manufacturing, and product safety with respect to the microbial contamination. Then, even though BAS standards are voluntary, is basically, but some products of mass consumption affecting the health and safety of the consumer 
are brought under the compulsory or mandatory BAS certification, marking under various act and rule. Even though BAS is voluntary, for some products of mass consumption, like food colors and their preparations, food additives, food preservatives, Vanaspati, milk products, infant foods, in addition to the FSSA registration licensing or food, you also require the BIS approval actually because they are the commodities for mass consumption. So that is the act. So even though FSA is there, we still have the BIS for some commodities, which is mandatory. Otherwise, most of the BIS standards are voluntary. So in addition to the BIS, we also have these Asmark standards. Still, Asmark standards, Asmark grades are used for uh, different commodities like the Directorate of Marketing and Inspection. They formulate the grades standards known as HACMAR with the relevant quality definition and grade de designation mark in respect of various agricultural, horticulture, livestock, dairy and forest products. Because the FSA may not deal with the forest products. They may not deal with their raw horticulture, livestock, or agriculture products. But HACMAR has a standard. They make the rules for many of these raw products which are not dealt by uh, FSSAI, but many of these rules or regulations are voluntary in nature. So, in addition to the BIS, in addition to the AGMARC, you also have the ECHO marks, which are about, uh, uh, which is from the Ministry of Environment and Forest, and they are instituted on labeling environment friendly products. This is just to show that your products is environment friendly. It is mainly used in tea and coffee, refined vegetable oils and vanaspati, food additives, preservatives processed food and vegetables, infant foods and beverages. In addition to these, you also have FPO, food products order mark, still being used in some of the cold drinks and beverages. You have uh, ISI, which is mainly used by majority of the industrial products, whether it's electronic goods, whether it's the cars, vehicles, bikes, we use ISI. The BAS hallmark, it is mainly used for the gold jewelry. You have food products order, FPO, logo which is used by packaged beverages in addition. We also have India organic that is mainly used for the organic products that are from the NPOP, National Program for Organic Production. There are, so these are the different certifications, different logos, which are mainly voluntary in nature, which are used in addition to the FSSA standards. Okay, in addition, you also have the International Organization for Standardization, which is a non-governmental organization which do the third party research risk assessment studies. You, I am sure you all might be aware of ISO 17025, which is National Accreditation Board for Testing and Calibration, which determines the competency of the laboratories. You have ISO 18,000, ISO 22,000, which speaks about the food safety, which speaks about food safety. So these are additional standards, additional certification as a food process uh, need to think of implementing in your products or in your plants. So the question is, whether all these certifications or all these standards are accepted globally. Anyway, I am not covering those things. So globally, you have a GFSI, which is called Global Food Safety Initiative. So if some of you, if some process, some industry person want to get these certification, food safety certification, you need to think whether this certification is recognized or approved by the GFSI, Global Food Safety Initiatives. Because it may be approved by the FSSAI, so we may have these standards, but again, these standards or these certifications may not be recognized by the global bodies. If you want to export your product, you need to see that your standards or your certifications are accredited or they are approved by the global certifying agencies and global bodies. So that is the prime purpose if you are an industry person. Actually. So, but anyway, I am not covering the GFSI, the Global Food Safety Initiatives or FSMS uh, in this presentation. Maybe we'll have a different presentation uh, for those details. So now the question is, why do we need these standards? Why FSSAS standards? Why BAS or AGMA standards? Why do we need these standards? To protect the consumer from hazards, I mean, protect the consumer from the hazards of penetration of, and help the industry to produce safe, hygienic, and healthy products. The standards in the manufacturing services promote efficiency and along with the quality assurance, minimizes production base, cuts cost, increase productivity and profitability as well as competitiveness. The consumer is primarily interested in his or her health being protected from the hazards of consuming contaminated or adulterated food than the legal action. So no one wants the legal action. They want to ensure the food safety. So in order to safeguard the consumer interest, the food standards must be adopted and implemented. That is the reason why 
the FSSAI has been created under a single ministry, and they are trying to harmonize our domestic standards with the global standards so that both exports and domestic safety is protected. So that is the purpose. So you have a different bodies, different agencies who approves, who give you certification for export your, uh, of your products. Actually, just to give you a brief, what is this export inspection council? So they give you certification, they approve your uh, facilities so that you can use those standards. You can use those certifications to export your product to the different countries. There is one agency called Export Inspection Council under Ministry of Commerce. So under EAC, you have a different export inspection agencies, a different 30 National Accreditation Board for Testing and Calibration Laboratories. You have their agencies located at Mumbai, Kochi, Chennai and Kolkata and different laboratories. So they help you in analyzing your product. They give you certification. They approve your lab and they approve your processing facility. And if you are a poultry processor, if you are a chicken processor, in addition to getting FSSAI licensing or FSA certificate, you also need to obtain a EIC Export Inspection Council certification if you want to export your product. Of course, now the government is thinking to combine all these EIC, APEDA and other uh, export agencies they want to bring down under one umbrella so that a processor need not to think of getting different approval from all the three agencies actually, because these are three agencies. One is Export Inspection Council and another is Agriculture and Processor Food Products Export Development Authority who deal with all these food commodities. On the left side, you can see they deal with the export of fruits, vegetables, meat and meat products, poultry products. If you are a poultry processor, you need to obtain permission from the APEDA and also permission from the Export Inspection Council. That's why now we are talking at the ministry level. We are talking at FSAI to reduce this burden on the processor. Why one has to get certification from the EIC and also from the APEDA and also obtain FSSI licensing. It is burden on the processor. So they need to put their significant manpower, time, everything in dealing with all these agencies and all these uh, auditing which happens actually. So now we are thinking, we are trying to bring all things under one umbrella so that there will be one agency one auditing, one certification. You need not to go with EIC, APEDA, MPEDA, and various agencies to get the approval. So shortly it is going to come. So at the ministerial level and the FSA level, the discussions are going on, and we are all part of it actually. So you all might be knowing the FSA. I mean, this APEDA has a headquarters at New Delhi, and they have more than eight or ten regional offices located in different states. And also we have the MPEDA, Marine Products Export Development Authority. Those who want to export the fish and related products. They need to obtain certification. They need to obtain permissions from the MPEDA. Of course, MPEDA is has a very limited scope, and also they are very aggressive in their marketing strategy. Even they have the trade promotion offices located in Tokyo and New York. So that is how we are able to export our fish or fish products to the developed countries. So we are also talking with the ministries. Why not APEDA or why not uh, EIC should have their offices in developed countries like US or the Europe or the Australia so that. It will give more impetus to our poultry processors to export their products to the developed nation. So that that is the crux uh, we need to think of. Uh, so that let us expand. We need, we can expand our export of poultry products in the coming years if our export agencies take more proactive steps in trade promotion, especially in the developed countries. Actually, so the, all these discussions are going on. We want that EAC and APEDA also should come up in a similar way like MPEDA, even there, even though their scope is uh, much bigger. Actually. So this is little bit about the different agencies who deal with the export and about the voluntary and the mandatory standards. So now comes to the FSSAI, which is an uh, actual uh, topic which was assigned to me. So, sir, I hope I still have another 20, 25 minutes. Maybe I can speak up to 12 o'clock. Zende, sir. Uh, yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. No. Okay, no. fine. No. Okay. So now, sir, after knowing no. about... So now we learned about the different global agencies, the global standards, and other agencies who makes different voluntary standards like BIS or AGMARC, and what are these export agencies? Let us come to uh, Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. So what they do, they develop standards, and they do surveillance, monitoring, and ensure the safety of the food around the country. So that is the primary mandate or the primary objective of the FSL. So how do they develop the standards? As a part of the scientific panel, so 
I just would like to highlight because the as an industry people, you all know the standards are made by the FSA. So how the FSA make these standards? FSA has a scientific panels. So the scientific panel is comprised of eight or ten uh, scientists or faculty members which are expert who are expert in the different commodities. So these scientific panels make the standards which are on par with the codex standards because ultimately our standards need to be uh, harmonized with the codex standards. So we make the standards. The scientific panel make the standards, and these standards will be sent to the scientific committee. The scientific committee sits above the scientific panels. The scientific committee has a chairman of each of these scientific panel and a few other expert members. The scientific committee validate these standards and these standards will go online for public comments. So that, that, that they're called draft standards. That is when most of the industries give your comments about these standards for modification or any changes. So after receiving the public comments, again, these standards are modified by the scientific panel and then they will be sent to the food authority. At the FSA, they have an authority. So finally, the, once the authority approves these, then it will be passed and it will be published in the Gazette notification. That's how the final standards comes out. Just to give about a brief, presently the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India almost have 21 scientific panels. So for every commodity, whether it is a milk, meat, fish, spices, pharmaceutical, nutraceutical products, functional foods, antibiotic residues, packaging and labeling, contaminants and toxins for every category. So they are again based on the codex guidelines. The codex has a specific guidelines based on the codex guidelines. The FSSA has created almost 21 scientific panel. The chairman of each of these panels are member of the scientific committee. In addition to these chairmen, the scientific committee was also very senior people who are the members of the scientific committee who do validation of the standards developed by the scientific committee. Okay, this is just an example of how the scientific committee panel is formulated. So I am the member of scientific panel for meat and meat products, including the poultry. So each of these panels, they have a faculty members or scientists from a specific institutions who work with the meat and poultry. So around 10 or 8 or 12 panel members have been identified. So these panel members will develop the standards with inputs from the codex standards, which are already existing actually. And once these standards are made by the scientific panel, the same will be validated by the scientific committee. And then it goes for the public comment. And after receiving that, the food authority will finally load it. This is how the standards are made by the FSSAI. As I told, as per the WTO requirement, whatever the country, whatever the domestic standards we have, those standards need to be harmonized with the codex standards. This is what the FSA is doing. So we are developing the standards and they are harmonized with the codex standard. So these standards are broadly categorized into two categories. One is horizontal standards and another is vertical standards. Horizontal standards are nothing but the general standards. They are across all the commodities, packaging and labeling. It is common to all the commodities, contaminants, residues and toxins. So they are called horizontal standards. In addition to that, we have specific standards, standards which are specific to the meat, specific to the milk or poultry or fish and different. They are called vertical standards. So FSSA makes standards, horizontal standards and vertical standards. This is just to give an information what is this difference between horizontal and vertical standards. So I urge all of you to please visit the FSSA website. It is very dynamic, very user friendly. You get all the information, anything related, whether it's your industry person, whether you are a student, you can visit this FSA website, then go on the top, just click on the standards. You will get the information about the panels, the committees, what are the different standards developed. Even if you click on the standards, you will get what are the product standards, which are already formulated, approved and published in the Gazette notification. So these are some of the standards which are already available in the FSA website. So all the students who are looking for different standards, your study material. So you'll get, so it's a very interactive website, FSA website, very dynamic, and every day they are updating uh, this website. So I urge you to go through this website, you'll get a lot of information, anything related to the food safety in the country. Okay, that's about the standards. Then comes to food safety compliance system. If any meat processor, a retail meat shop, a butcher shop, or a poultry processor, a poultry farmer, if you want to get a FSA certification, if you want to get a FSA registration, so what is the procedure actually? So within the FSA website, if you scroll down, 
on the left side and the bottom, you can see the food safety compliance system, post course link again. If you click on the post course food safety compliance system link, it will take you to the food safety compliance system uh, home page. So if you go to the home page, there's a lot of information. Even if you are a petty food manufacturer, if you are a small butcher shop, wherein you are slaughtering around 10 or 20 birds. So how you can get a local registration? If you are a small processor, you need to get only local registration. If you are a big manufacturer, you need to get either state licensing or central licensing. It depends on your annual turnover. Anyone with an annual turnover of less than 12 lakh per annum, you need only local registration. The local registration fee is only 100 rupees. So any processor can apply online actually. There are simple forms. You can see here, there are various windows will open once you uh, click on these windows, you will get a very simple procedure where you can apply online. You get an OTP on your mobile and you get a certification within 15 days, 20 days if you comply with all the requirements. So in addition to that, you also have this uh, know your officer. If you click on the know your officer, every district place and every place you have, uh, in, especially in the metro cities like Mumbai, Hyderabad, Delhi, you have a lot of food safety officers in each area. There are more than 50, 70 officers in Mumbai probably. You will get their phone number, you will get their email ID. So you can just call them and ask them what you require, what you need to, what you need if you want to get a FSA permission or the registration or the licensing actually. So they will uh, help you actually. So this is how a small uh, petty food business operator or a big processor, how one can get your, get your login ID password and you can apply online for all these things actually. So this is to know your officer. If you just enter your PIN code in the state, the local food safety officer number, everything will be available online. You just call him and you can get what need to be done. They will help you in uh, obtaining uh, the food safety registration or certification for your plan. So this is how the, your application will be moved. So all the details are given. If you want to apply licensing and registration, these are different steps actually. So just upload all your uh, documents, your other number, your phone number, the photographs of your inside of the plant or your uh, retail bead shop. Your water quality analysis, they are mainly concerned with the water quality analysis. Get your water license from an enable accredited lab, get the certificate. So that will do your purpose actually. So you'll get your certification uh, within a month or two months. So they have all the deadlines, all the criteria fixed for that actually. So what is the fee structure? So if we have a slaughterhouse, so whether you require a central licensing or you require a state licensing or you require a registration, there are three different categories when you when you go for licensing, central licensing, state licensing, and local registration. If you are slaughtering more than 50 large animals or more than 150 sheep or goat or more than 1,000 birds per day, you require central licensing. If your turnover every day is only 3 to 50 large animals or 11 to 150 sheep or less than 1,000 poultry birds, you require state licensing. If you are slaughtering less than 50 birds, any poultry, roadside poultry shops, if you are starting on less than 50 birds per day, you require only a local registration. The requirements for local registrations are very small. Only one or two points which you need to complete and you need to pay only 100 rupees. I think three year a registration you will get actually. So this will give confidence to the customer who come to your shop for buying. So in other sense, if your annual turnover is less than 12 lakh rupees, you need to get only the local registration. You don't require central licensing or uh, state licensing. So that's about the food safety compliance system, very simple. If you visit the food safety authority site, you'll get all the information actually. So you also have Eat Right India. In addition to the POSCOs, in addition to the standards, they have also have one more link. You can visit Eat Right India. So through this, uh, the FSA is trying to uh, ensure the food safety across the country. So the I mean, rankings of uh, the different states based on the food safety, and even they do the rating of the restaurants, rating of the processing plant, you can apply under the Eat Right India logo, I mean website, you can just go into that, whether you have a meat retail shop, whether you have a sweet shop, bakery, so you can get a rating for your processing plant or for your canteen or for your uh, uh, private company. So just go there. So when you want to apply for rating, so if you want to apply for rating of your poultry processing plant, there are 48 hygiene checklists which the FSA auditor, the third party auditor will come and you will complete, you will, you will just verify whether you comply with all these checklists uh, drafted or made by the FSI. So once you comply with them, they give you rating. They give you rating. Even if you have your uh, university canteen, 
you can get an FSA rating for your university canteen. Any three star, five star hotel. When we go to five star hotel, we have a feeling that because they got five star, it's a five star hotel. Similarly, if you are a poultry processor, if you have a processing plant, if you have a retail shop, you can get this E right rating. If you get a five star rating or four star rating, like excellent, very good. That gives confidence to the consumer. When a consumer walk into your meat shop, if you say you have a five star rating from the FSSAI, that gives confidence to the consumer. You are following a very good or stringent food safety norms. I think as a food safety graduates or as an industry people, you need to promote, you need to popularize these. I mean, these schemes which are uh, which are available from different I mean FSA ministry, I mean FSA agency. I think not many people, not many food scientists are even aware of this. Just promote and popularize so that let meat processor, meat industry, let them know it actually, so they can apply and they can get it through this uh, auditing process. The FSA also do the auditing of different states, and every year they come out with a state food safety index. So where do you stand? Where does Maharashtra stand in terms of food safety index 2021? So they categorize the states into larger states and smaller states and union territories. So out of 20 larger states, this Gujarat state stands number one in terms of food safety index, followed by Kerala and followed by Tamil Nadu, number one, two, and three. The Maharashtra stands almost 15 out of 20 states in terms of a food safety index. And the state where I'm currently working is a Telangana, it stands around 10 out of 20 largest states in terms of food safety index. So how do they do this ranking? So this ranking is done based on five parameters, which is uh, human resources and institutional data. So what are the human resources you have in your state to ensure the food safety? Compliance, how many of your small, medium, large processors, they are getting registration, they are getting certifications. How many of them have implemented HACCP or food safety management system? So it has almost 30% weighted. Food testing infrastructure and surveillance, how many NABL accredited laboratory you have? How many EIC, Export Inspection Council accredited lab? How many other food safety or food testing lab, your uh, surveillance and monitoring? Training and capacity building. How many institutions are involved in training and capacity building? How many trained people you have in consumer empowerment? How many consumers are empowered or knows about the food safety? So they consider all these safety parameters and they do this state food safety index. So I hope at the end of this presentation, you should know there is an agency who do this state food safety index and where your state stands when it comes to food safety. Because we have been eating a lot of biryanis in Hyderabad, maybe Wada Pao in Mumbai. Whether you are really hygienic, whether where your state stands, so you should be aware so that you can better propagate, better popularize among the food processor in your state. So in addition to the post course, the eat right, you also have the post stack which is called food safety training and certification. Through this post stack, the FSA will train people and these trainers will conduct the certification program so that they will get a certificate called food safety inspectors. So now as per the post stack, or as per the FSA guideline, any food business operator, any restaurant who have 25 employees, they should have one food safety supervisor. The food one become anyone can become food safety supervisor if he undergoes a four stack training program. So there are four stack empaneled centers. There are four stack empaneled private companies or four stack uh, uh, accredited individuals. So they very frequently organize these four stack training program. So any one of you, even if you are a student, you can become a food safety mitra or you can become a four stack certified food safety supervisor. So that it will give a better employing, uh, employable opportunities actually, because now as per the new guidelines, any restaurant which has a 25 employees should have one food safety supervisor. So that is going to come. So the post is a very good program. I want all of you to go through the post website. So even our center is a post uh, empanel center. We are planning to conduct a regular post training program so that you will become a food safety inspector. So the post provides training program for people in different categories, whether you want to be a post tax supervisor or uh, for meat and meat products, for fish and fish products, many for different commodities, they have different modules. They have a basic module, they have advanced courses, they have special courses. So if you qualify these, these are all just eight hour courses or 24 hour courses. If you qualify these courses, so you will become a food safety inspector. So you, you will be eligible to apply for different positions and it will be added advantage in your 
a CV actually to get these certifications actually. So in addition to the post tag, they also have uh, info that is Indian Food Laboratory Network. So it is one more a link if you get inside. So uh, inside the FSA website actually, you will get a lot of information about Indian Food Laboratory Network, especially our people from our industry, our industry friends. If you want to get your sample analyzed, so that you are a certified factory, you are a certified company, you need to get your sample analyzed from the NABL accredited lab or maybe EAC approved lab or FSA approved lab. They have, get, they have got an information about all these FSA accredited or approved lab in Indian Food Laboratory Network. There is a separate link within the FSA website. So please go to this, you'll get a lot of information. So as per the FSA now recently released data, so they have almost 220 FSA recognized laboratories, 18 referral laboratories, and 12 national referral laboratories as per the FSA recent data. So the NRC and MEAT, we also have a FSA referral laboratory mainly for meat species identification. So there are around 18 laboratory. I'm just listing, uh, highlighting our institute, which is also FSA referral lab. In addition to that, they also have a 12 FSA national laboratory. There are ICR institutions like ICR National Research Center on Grapes and Central uh, Institute for Fisheries Technology. So they are a national referral laboratory. So any one of you who want to send your sample because they have specific scope so send your sample for some of the analysis so that you get a certificate because you all have a certified facility so they carry more meaning if you get your sample analyzed from these third party audited certified uh, companies or fsa accredited uh, laboratories i think with this i have covered a lot of things about the certification this fsa standards the food safety compliance then post tag the eat right and Indian Food Laboratory Network, because when we say FSI, so these are important component of the FSI. I want at the end of this presentation, especially the students and many industry people, all of you should know about different FSI components, what for you can use, what for they are available, how the FSI is trying to ensure the food safety across the country. So with this, I think I have taken almost one hour. So I just would like to conclude by saying, the post COVID now food safety reforms and hygiene solution. So they are need of the our action. So we need a lot of reforms when it comes to the food safety. We cannot continue to have a retail poultry shop or butcher shop in every street, especially in the city like Mumbai, with a course of population where we are talking about a one health, we are talking about antimicrobial resistance. If we have a DNR of tire within the city limits. And we have a poultry shops in every street corner. Whenever the pandemic happens, people will target these shops. They target these our tires. We need policy decision. We need some reforms. Do we need to continue with these meat shops, these poultry shops within our densely populated cities like Mumbai, Delhi, or Hyderabad? They are okay in district places or taluk places. They are okay in smaller cities where the population density is less. But in bigger cities. We need some reforms. We need some uh, studies. We need more hygiene solution. How to ensure safety? Then, food, safe foods or food safety need transparency. So, especially for our industry friends, if you want to ensure safety, if you want to ensure the empowerment of the consumer, if the public or consumer wants more confidence about our product, if you want that, consumers need to feel more confidence of, about our chicken, whatever the chicken. The Venkis or Suguna or whatever they produce, people are more bothered that a lot of they bothered about AMR because there are agencies, there are people who constantly stress about the AMR, antimicrobial resistance. They talk about the one health. So consumer has a doubt about the safety of these products. They doubt about the antibiotic residue. They doubt about the microbial quality. So we need transparency in food safety. When we say our chicken is safe, our products are safe, we need to be more transparent. I urge all our industry people to please come forward uh, and please get a best of the certification so that it gives best of third party audited certifications, implement food safety management system, implement HACCP, say to the consumers that what we are following are global standards, our chicken is safe, our meat is safe. So that is need of the hour. We need more transparency because I'm a meat scientist. Very often I keep telling people whatever we produce, our production system is more natural. natural more sustainable, more organic. We very often use antibiotics, not many hormones, not many 
insecticide and pesticide residue we use. So in that sense, our products are more safe. So we have a best system, best sustainable system. Only thing is we need to give more confidence to the consumers. And again, the food scientists, graduates, manufacturer, producers, retailer, whether you are industry people, we need to live by food safety principle every day. We need to promote, we need to popularize. There are various guidelines, there are various rules, there are various acts. The government or the ministries are coming out with new schemes, new regulations. So we need more reforms at the same time. We need to promote, popularize the safe food among the public. So with this, uh, I think I finished my presentation uh, and I also thank uh, all the participants and uh, the organizers for inviting me. So you can note down my email ID if some of you have any clarifications or any doubt. So you can keep interacting with me in the coming days also. So with this, I am ready for any interactions or any clarifications or questions from you. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for your very nice and informative presentation. You have covered all the aspects of the FSSI, so uh, which are uh, um, maybe new for so many of us. So you have, you have covered all the topics, uh, all the areas in a very nice manner. Now I request uh, the participants if they have uh, any uh, query, so they can ask directly to sir, or they can uh, write their questions in the chat box. So uh, the participants they are requested if they have any query, so they can uh, ask the questions. Sir, uh, one question is there in the chat box. Uh, when the recalling of the product is done? Hmm. Okay. So when the recalling of, uh, can you repeat the question once again? That's all. Uh, uh, sir, uh, the question is when the recalling of product is done and by whom it is done. Okay. So suppose if you are a company, uh, imagine you have you have implemented the food safety management system FSMS. If you are ISO 22000 or FSSC 22000 factory or process, the food recall is a component of ISO 22000. It is a component of your food safety management system. Suppose imagine I have prepared uh, maybe a uh, two tons of products, two tons of chicken sausage or chicken emulsion, and I have distributed to different places actually, and later I. I will come to know that one of my employee was COVID positive when these products were made. So this is a fit case for food recall. Of course, there are no risk assessment studies done to say that if a food product is prepared by a COVID positive patient and if it's thoroughly cooked, packed and distributed, so whether it has any safety issues or not, but still as per the guidelines, we need to recall those products because we came to know that the product prepared by some employee, one of the employees was found positive for the COVID. In that case, we need to recall our product. So who will do the recalling? If you are a food safety management system implemented, you will have a food safety team leader. It is the food safety team leader who is responsible for recalling your product. Under FSMS, if you have ISO certified company, you have a well thoroughly established procedures how to do the recalling. So it's a it's a very standard protocol, very standard procedure, which will be part of the FSMS. It is the food safety team leader who will take a call at. So under what circumstances you need to do the food recall? Now, traceability and food recall, uh, uh, highly talked subjects actually. Everywhere people are talking about these two. I hope I answered your question, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other question? Anybody want to ask? Any question? Hi, Suman, how are you? Sir, one question is there. Uh, some, uh, I think industry person is asking. Okay, I'll just question. check the chat. I'll just check the chat box. Ah, yes, sir, yes, sir. You okay. can, you please, please, sir. Okay. Why require provision act of voluntary? So uh, that's a good thing. We have been discussing when we have the FSSAI, FSSA Act and the regulation, which are uh, mandatory in nature, but still why we are continuing with the BIS or why we are continuing with the AGMARC actually, why voluntary grades? Uh, the thing is the FSSAI role will start after the harvesting. So we need standards for maybe pet foods, we need standards for animal foods, we need standards for raw products. But 
for the finished products in addition to the fsa why any voluntary uh, standards are required again a lot of discussion is happening so very soon probably uh, they are all going to be merged so we will not be having the separate bis because they are statutory bodies created right. right. under ministries and now it is difficult uh, for government to close down immediately probably it may take some time when this bis hardmark fsa so everything will be clubbed and there will be one single standard so so probably it is going to be resolved as of now it is only voluntary whether it's hardmark or bis thank you sir Sir, two more questions are there in the chat box. Okay. For any meat plant where canteen is available for snack and tea, it is mandatory to take FSSAI license for canteen. Yeah, if you are a pri private organization or private company, for you everything is a mandatory, sir. Because I am from government institution. So usually we have some relaxation, so we are uh, exempted even if you are not taking. But if you are a private person, yes, you should have uh, FSAI because any time the, I mean, uh, the food safety officer, food safety inspector may walk into your facility and you are liable to be punished actually. So, uh, they, of course, these are the rules, these are the regulations made. You need to have FSAI license even for your canteen if you have a, but again, it depends. If you already have a FSSAI license, central licensing for your whole plan, probably your canteen is also covered technically. So may not be in the real sense, but if you have at least central licensing or state licensing, that will take care to some extent. So it's not necessary. Again, you should have a separate licensing for your canteen, not required. So you can go ahead if you have a central licensing. So which are the labs where we can test for a species identification of the meat products in South India, sir, actually. Uh, uh, it's only a national research center on meat, ICR, NRC, and meat. Okay, so that is my institute. So we have NABL accredited laboratories uh, for meat species identification. So there are many private, there are many other uh, state, I uh, mean, veterinary uh, colleges, many other animal husbandry departments, including IVRI. But no one is giving you a NABL accredited certification. They are all uh, just for the research purpose people have done. But actual certification, actual recommendation is done by NRCFB. There are not many private labs because private lab doesn't have uh, meat species authentication identification facilities. They may have some labs. They have the ELISA kits and all. But if you are if you want a certification, if you want authentic, authentic data, so it is NRCFB who is doing presently, which is. A FSSA referral laboratory and also NABL accredited facility. So, why do we require FSA license for meat transport vehicle? I think FSA guidelines cover starting from yeah, uh, it, meat transport vehicle. Once the animal is slaughtered, till your meat reaches the consumer, the entire value chain or the entire supply chain is covered under FSA. Live animal transport, you don't require FSA. But if you're transporting the meat, shall packaged meat or frozen meat, you require FSA license. Because after once you slaughter the animal, it will be it will come under the FSA permit. So you require that. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, you have covered. Uh, you have answered all the questions. Uh, so thank you for uh, your precious time which you have given to us. Uh, so I request Jende, sir, uh, to please. Uh, 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 give thanks to Navina sir. Jinde sir, please. Hello. Ah, yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Uh, Navina, th thank you so much. The very, very in detail uh, and very informative, uh, uh, excellent presentation you have given. And I think uh, all the uh, participants and uh, industry people they must have enjoyed it and uh, got the latest information about the. the EPCSI, role of EPCSI in the various food industries like uh, dairy, meat, fishery and other allied uh, in industries mainly involved in our country, those who are in export and also for the domestic uh, businesses. Uh, I, I thank uh, profusely uh, Dr. Namina for invite, uh, our accepting our uh, invitation and, and within very short period of time. I know you are very busy in organizing such a kind of the training programs at your institute also. But you have taken time and uh, interacted with our participant. Uh, thank you so much. And I also uh, expect 
the same cooperation in the near future also thank you thank, thank you, you, thank so you sir. all the best all the best participant thank you thank you very much good luck thank you thank you sir dr vivek ha yes sir thank you sir thank you navina sir so now we have uh, uh, next speaker uh, dr suman talukdar sir so sir is uh, working as a senior scientist in the division of lpt livestock products technology uh, uh, i icr iwri and sir is going to uh, deliver his lecture on uh, measures for economic utilization of slaughterhouse waste so i request uh, jente sir to please uh, give brief information about uh, dr suman talukdar sir agenda uh, sir please thank you thank you vivek uh i have the great pleasure to introduce uh, today's second uh, guest a uh, speaker dr suman talukdar he is uh, working presently as a senior scientist in the division of uh, livestock product technology icr ivr i bareilly uh suman i first of all i thank uh, from my bottom of heart because you have accepted within i think 11 hours he be ready with the, because our uh, scheduled uh, speaker he got ill and uh, is operated uh, angiography so the, i thank you uh, very much for accepting our uh, invitation and ready for delivering today's talk uh suman he has a wide experience in the meat science and technology especially in the field of functional livestock products meat and meat product uh, packaging he has handled the various intramural as well as extramural research project which are mainly funded by the various uh, government agencies like icr dbt mopi gsp etc and he is currently working as a pi and co pi in about three research projects at ivri Uh, he has uh, uh, many research articles at his uh, credit in the which are published in the reputed national and international journals uh, he has developed uh, many technologies and which are also adopted by the certain industries and uh, he has applied uh, he has got a patent for his credit on the plate dye based quality indicator plate dye based time temperature indicator chicken and mutton puppet then meat links table lotus stem jack food green plantain etc incorporated restructured meat products plant based salt replacer for meat products restructured chicken drumstick okay so these are the areas where uh, dr suman has worked uh, extensively he has guided about uh, five uh, post graduate student and has been working in the various uh, technical committees as well and guiding the students fraternity He has conducted uh, training programs and workshops organized organized by the division of the LPT ICR IVRI for the various stakeholders like uh, students and uh, faculties also from the uh, various uh, people that are working in the industries also. So we have uh, the right person to talk on the topic that is the suitable measures for the economic utilization of the slaughterhouse waste. So I invite uh, Dr. Suman to. Uh, present the topic so dr suman please good morning uh, good morning dr jende dr vivek and all the faculty members present there and it's a i i wish to thank from core of my heart for inviting me to have this kind of interaction with the uh, different um, uh, sphere of indian um, uh, gathered here from different corner of india so thank you very much and uh, uh, before uh, i wish to uh, to start my regarding my topic i formally i wish to thank uh, to all the uh, dr jinde and dr vivek to call me here to recall me here to present here in front of you so without wasting of lot of time so i'll be starting regarding the topic that is a suitable measure for economic utilization of slaughterhouse by product mainly actually india is bestowed uh, <clears throat> with huge livestock population it uh, varies from uh, large ruminant from cattle buffalo to small uh, sheep and goat and this contribute a huge proportion of con uh, means uh, non vegetarian food item that is meat to the diet of indian consumer but as every year thousands of uh, animal are being slaughtered for production of meat along with the meat production they generally produce different kind of by products and the waste generally in term of so called waste Though they are not waste, they generally uh, produce along with the 
production of the meat. Meat is the main product along with the different kind of byproducts is generally being produced. Those can be utilized for further value addition and can be used to, to in, increase the income or the profit of the uh, producer, obviously, the animal producer. So, <clears throat> Uh, that is the topic what we are going to discuss today. But uh, before that, I wish to uh, means, uh, show you what kind of the kinds of byproducts generally mainly they are divided into two. That is the edible form and this inedible form. Mainly you, you know most of them. You have, uh, that is liver, kidney, heart, brain, testis, thymus, tongue, spleen, meat trimmings, fat, etc. Those comes under the edible kind of byproducts. Whereas the height, skin. Uh, gallbladder, fetus, hoop, horn, hair, and bristle, this comes under the inedible kind of. So you can see here on the live weight basis, the meat constitutes the maximum portion, that is the 28% around, whereas bone, head, and the feet constitute 22%, whereas punch content and the waist constitute 16%, height 7.5, and other opals, blood, casing, lung, fat, liver, stomach, heart, tongue, spleen, and kidney, so on. You can see in that table. So they constitute <clears throat> male component, that is the meat, was only constitute 28 percent other than that, that most of them comes under the byproduct and that's why there is a huge, pot huge potential to add value to them so that we can increase the profit to the uh, producer mainly indirectly why we should uh, utilize the slaughterhouse byproduct this along with the economic gain some other aspects are also there that is it can protect the environment from getting polluted it helps to supply of high quality nutritive feed to the livestock products, it helps in setting up of secondary rural industries to generate new employment and increase the crop production by production of different kind of fertilizer or some uh, component which can increase the crop production also. So, <clears throat> in our country, due to huge livestock density, there are requirement of livestock uh, that live uh, animal byproducts processing plants. Each 50 kilometer square kilometer require one plant as per our requirement, but the number is not as per the requirement, it is very less. That's why we need to improve the status. My government um, policies need to be there so that different slaughterhouse byproducts and animal byproducts uh, processing plants can be set up. But before setting up of any slaughterhouse uh, animal byproducts uh, processing plan, we need to concentrate some uh, points. Those are, it should be adjacent to the slaughterhouse, obviously. If possible, it should be connected with the slaughterhouse with different uh, gravity rail mainly. Other than that, it should be away from the innovated areas. It should have own screen drainage system. This slaughter uh, animal byproduct processing plant should have clean and dirty areas, specifically it should be separated from each other. And it should have hide and skin, salting room, renderers, strippery, manure bunkers, and stores separately. They should have well ventilated areas and the rooms, and they should have a boiler, which is very much inevitable because of processing uh, production of the steam and hot water so that it can be used for the production of the cleaning treatment. The main section of slaughterhouse animal byproducts uh, processing plants that is the hide and skin section, gut processing section and carcass utilization plant. These three main components should be there in a uh, byproduct processing plant. <laughs> Uh, in carcass utilization plant, the rendering is the main process. Rendering is nothing but the processing of uh, whatever the byproducts are there, the application of heat, so that different value added products can be obtained. Mainly, that is the proteinaceous solid is generated, other than that, fat is also generated. This is one of the most important product generated from the rendering process. Rendering uh, can be of either of two process by either dry or wet kind of rendering. Both are in use, but some having uh, means the profit of dry rendering. That is the advantage of dry rendering is that yield is around 20% higher than that of wet rendering. Whereas in case of wet rendering, the fat recovery is higher. Now, another important point that is the utilization of fallen animal. Fallen animal are those, those animals which generally die due to natural cause or some other disease or any kind of traumatic condition. This animal generally is being thrown off to some specific places in our society, but this can be this animal, these fallen animals can be the source of huge amount of uh, income generation. Like this, the hide and skin, which is belongs to this fallen animal can be used for the production of the leather and leather articles, whereas in the carcass can be utilized for the production of carcass meal, meat meal, technical fat and bone meal. What technical fat exactly is? Technical fat is the fat 
which is obtained from the rendering process, but this fat cannot be utilized for the production of the human food or this cannot be introduced in the human food chain, but they are utilized for the production of some, any other technical purpose like industrial production of soap, then uh, means, uh, different kind of uh, cosmetics, all this can be utilized for uh, by application of this technical fat. This technical fat having high energy value and this having uh, mainly the, any individual kind of byproduct is categorized as. If this is being produced with specific kind of procedure like centrifugation, the stability of this kind of fat can be increased so that their shelf life can be increased further. Now you can see the utilization of technical fat. This technical fat mainly being utilized in the oleo oleochemical industry, mainly the cosmetic industry. For the cosmetic industry, this technical fat is a as a means a boon because these are the basic material for production of different cosmetics. Other than that, surfactant, lubricants, and the biodiesel production are the some other field where this technical fat can be utilized. The technical fat uh, means uh, in means acceptability or the demand of technical fat is gradually increasing because this is being gen this is a natural product because this comes from the animal. Therefore, the demand is increasing from 10 percent to the current year to it is expected 30% in 2030. Other than that, this uh, technical fat can be utilized for preparation of different lubricants, plastic uh, preparation, cleaning agent preparation, coating, glue preparation, the softener, emulsifier, additives, and rubber, paper, print, etc. These are the industry where this technical fat can be utilized. Now, uh, uh, whenever one animal is slaughtered, huge amount of the blood, around 5 to 7 percent of the live body weight is constituted by the blood, and this blood is generally being in small slaughterhouses that is being drained off. But this is having huge, uh, means both different kind of economical value. You can see uh, what are the different sections where this animal blood can be utilized. For the food production event, it can be used as emulsifier, stabilizer, clarifier, color additives, nutritional component. For even uh, for production of the feed also, this can be utilized for the license supplement and can be used as a milk substitute for the newborn calf. It can be utilized for the fertilizer production as seed coating material, soil pH stabilizer, mineral component provider. These are the utilized as in the crop production area. Other than that, in laboratories can be used as tissue culture medium, then blood agar, albumin and the globulin. These are the main component which can be utilized in laboratories. Other than that, medicine now that's pharmaceutical industries they are also having a lot of work with the application of the blood like immunoglobulins can be separated and can be utilized in as a medicine then blood clotting factors fibrinogen serotonin plasma extender these are the application in the medicine industry other than that some adhesive like uh, uh, finisher for the leather and the textile industry egg albumin substitute foam fire extinguisher ceramic plastic these are the industry where the blood having direct or indirect utilization now, other than that, this industrial application, this blood contain huge amount of the protein. It constitutes around 17 to 18 percent protein. This protein is generally uh, means throw away and drained away into the gutter. But this is not the proper utilization of the animal protein because Indian consumer is, devoid, is getting devoid of protein. They are malnutrited. So if this protein can be utilized for the production of a different kind of supplement, which can be added into their diet so that the protein uh, requirement can be fulfilled. Therefore, different protein can be derived separate means can be extracted from the blood and can be utilized in different uh, industrial application like this act as a emulsifier, as a stabilizer, as a clarifier, what I have told already. Other than that, the blood meal as a protein supplement can be infused in the feed of uh, especially the non-ruminant diet. Now, the blood meal is a, is a major component which is produced from the blood and it is uh, can be produced very easily. You can see uh, those steps that is the collection of the blood storage and transportation. The heat treatment is very much required. Then pressing so that the water component can be removed very easily. Thereafter, it should be dried and after cooling properly. Thereafter, milling is required. Then fumigation to make it uh, means devoid of any kind of uh, leftover bacteria or any kind of contamination. There, then thereafter, they should be packed and can be stored for further application. This blood meal is a, one of the important component for feed of different non-ruminant diet. Other than that, the fecal blood, that is the blood stored, that is uh, preserved with the application of different kind of acid, mainly sulfuric acid, and this can be stored for longer duration of time so that the putrefication of the blood can be 
<clears throat> avoided. Then blood charge, that is the carbon compound of whole blood treating with the chemicals like uh, potassium sulfide. This is act, this can be act as a decolorant agent, antidote of different poisoning and gas absorbent component. Other than that, uh, the blood foam compound, which is acts as a fire extinguisher, organic fertilizer application can be done with this because it contains around 12% nitrogen. So you can see different application of the blood is also there. Now, another component which constitutes the major portion of the animal slaughterhouse byproduct, that is the bone. Bone constitutes about 15% of the weight of the dressed carcass. You can see 15%. It's not the meager amount. From broke bone, the gelatin and the glue can be extracted very easily. That this gelatin and the glue is having different applications, like the gelatin used in ice cream industry for jelly preparation for chocolate industry, they are utilized nowadays. Foaming agent, capsule coating, binder, and the binder are the uh, binder for the tablets, some other use of this gelatin. Then blood extender can, as blood extender, this can be utilized. The sizing agent for leather and the textile industry. Then glue is utilized for adhesive in the plywood and the furniture industry. Or any DJ, my brother PG. Okay. Dr. Alok? Sir, please, uh, uh, now it is changed, sir. Okay. So the preparation of gelatin and glue, these are also having very uh, easy steps like collection of the bone, then washing and cutting them in small sizes. Then degreasing is one of the important steps by the application of the heat, then crushing into small pieces. Demineralization by the application of the hydrochloric acid and this treatment should be for one to two days. Then thorough washing thereafter, then extraction by the control hydrolysis by mainly the boiling at 60 degrees Celsius temperature. Then filtration of whatever the glue material or the gelatin has been extracted, then concentration by evaporation process, then drying and packaging. These are the easy, easy step for preparation of the glue and gelatin. Now, the another uh, component which can be prepared from this bone, that is the bone meal. It contains bone piece less than two millimeter diameter, and uh, these are the good source of calcium and the phosphorus supplement to the livestock. This, this, there are also very easy step for preparation of this bone meal. There is a collection and a cleaning, then sterilization by the application of the steam, at 60 pound pressure for two hours, thereafter draining of this water and the drying under sun and the milling and packaging. Another thing that is important in the cattle, uh, that uh, nutrition that is as a, used as a supplement, that is cattle leak. It is, it is used for the uh, sub feed supplement prepared from the bone meal by mixing with red oxide at 33% level. These are the component which can provide the sulfur, potassium, sodium, iodine, cobalt to the animal nutrition. The another thing which is can be obtained from the, means the bony structure that is the hoof and horn from that we can have the neat food oil neat food oil can be mainly obtained from the shin bone that is which is hidden inside the hoof and therefore it is to be scaled out and uh, cooking is required at 85 degrees celsius temperature and purification is also required therefore dry dehydration or making it dry and packaging this there this uh, neat food oil is having utilization for different delicate machineries like aeroplane, ship, and the watches. Utilization of the hoop and horn mainly different kind of uh, fashion and decorative items like the button, combs, handle, decorative pieces can be prepared from this application of the horn. UP, uh, there are different kind of industries which are utilizing this horn of mainly the buffaloes and preparing different kind of decorative materials and exporting them to different foreign overseas. Now, hoof and the horn mill, these are also utilized as a fertilizer because of huge content of nitrogen. Now, meat and bone mill, this constitute the bony portion and some meaty portion which is left over after the deboning operation. And mainly, these are 
utilized for the meal component of monogastric animal but nowadays these are having application for preparation of the fossil fuel replacement for renewable energy resources in foreign countries but nowadays in our country also different research work is also going on to prepare this kind of fuel replacement with application of meat and bone meal now that is the meat meal that is contain huge amount of the protein and this should be uh, free of hair, bristle, feather, horn, hoofs, mean any kind of inedible material should not be admixed with the meat meal. If only, then only it can be utilized as a protein source to the animal diet. Processing of meat meal, it is very much easy. First of all, the raw material to be grounded and to be cooked at the 115 to 145 degrees Celsius temperature for 40 to 90 minutes. Thereafter, moisture removal is required by pressing and then this to be dried and fat separation to be done and can be prepared into converted into powder and can be stored for further use mainly the meal component. Now animal intestine which is generally is not being used in India but this can also be utilized for the preparation of different kind of material among those the casein is most important. Casein is the coating under which the meat can be prepared uh, in the form of a sausages. Other than that the casings are that uh, intestine can be utilized for the production of the catgut string for different musical instrument. Mainly the subcutaneous region which contain huge amount of the collagen is utilized for the production of this kind of material. These are the steps how the intestine can be utilized for the production of the casing or some other material you can see. First of all you have to remove them very easily, you have to clean them properly by application of uh, process of fermentation and thorough cleaning with the application of the water. Thereafter, we have to uh, put in either in uh, salted condition or in dried form. In different different animals, different ways are there to store them. Now, uh, that is another important thing that is the animal gland, which are the which is a huge source of different biochemicals and how they can be utilized here in this slide. It is being shown. That is that these are the glands are known as a rich source of various biochemicals are the vital to develop different uh, accessible modern medicine. This constitute around 0.28% of the live animal weight. It can be acts as an antidiabetic agent, endocrinal component, as a sympathomimetic drug can be prepared from these enzymes for different application, food supplement, biochemicals, vitamins, hormones, or pigments are the different components which can be uh, obtained from these uh, glands. And some other some glands which are very much utilized that is the adrenal gland, parathy, parathyroid, pituitary, thyroid, ovaries, pancreas, and the testes. These glands are highly utilized for their different kind of activities. Active component, principal component it contains. Like medicinal product that can be procured from the element and animal glands, those are epinephrine, estrogen, progesterone, insulin, trypsin, parathyroid hormone. Adenocorticotropic hormones, uh, stomato, somatotropin, thyroid stimulating hormone, testosterone, and the thyroxine. These are the different hormone components which can be obtained from the animal glands. Therapeutic application you can see in treatment of the hepatitis, building of healthy red blood cells can be utilized, then treating of the chronic liver diseases, preventing the liver damage, regenerating liver tissue. These are the cases where these glands and their secretion and their principal component are utilized. This liver extract contains vitamins and the minerals and calcium, copper, phosphorus, iron. This can be utilized as nutraceuticals. Nowadays, people are so much health conscious and they need to have some concentrated medicinal, concentrated uh, means the nutrition, nutrients in the form of nutraceuticals. So they are having in high demand. Like heparin extracted from the lung and the small intestine prescribed as an anticoagulant drug and these are being utilized to prevent the blood, blood clot clotting during the surgery or in the organ transplantation. Now preparation of the acetone dried powder. Why acetone dried powder is required? Because to store this uh, gland for longer duration of time and their principal component can be in active form. They are collected thereafter removal of the different visible uh, dirt and the visible component that is the fat and the connective tissues thereafter they have to be cut into small pieces thereafter they have to treat it with the acetone and they are, they are after treating with the acetone, they need to be dried and converted into fine powder so that they can be stored for longer duration of time. Now, this is hydan skin, how these are being uh, separated from the animal body. You can see hydan skin are the basic component by which the leather and the leather articles are being generated by the process of tanning. Tanning is the process where conversion of the hydan skin can be done into the leather, leather so that 
it can be stored for longer duration of time and it can be utilized uh, for preparation of different um, uh, uh, articles for human application that is the leather leather is not uh, that leather is nothing that is the process hide and skin which is uh, store of the stability of which has been increased by the application by the process of tanning now utilization of the collagen as animal byproduct collagen is a dominant protein in the connective tissue of the animal body and derived from the slaughterhouse byproduct very easily mainly the pork and the beef where uh, byproducts are the main sources of the collagen from the actually stand on pericardium bovine bones inner layer of the skin these are the sources of the collagen the main source of the collagen of slaughterhouse byproducts are the skin tendon cartilage and the bone even the ear and the are one of the important source for the collagen and different bioactive component is gen, uh, generated from the collagen which is having application for ac inhibitor mainly there is the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor having activity and antioxidant activity also having this kind of peptides so therefore these peptides having uh, different uh, application and they are in huge demand now another thing which is in high demand that is the preparation of the pet food from the slaughterhouse byproducts nowadays human today's uh, this city dwellers they are keeping their pet they are very much known to them therefore they need to take care of them by application of this uh, uh, pet food and this pet food nowadays also the main component the major component of the pet food preparation that is the slaughterhouse byproduct pet food may be in different form that is the dry pet food wet pet food or intermediate moisture pet food on the basis of their moisture content what are the common ingredients for the pet food preparation mainly the damaged uh, that is the animal part used for the pet food mainly includes damaged car damaged carcass part bone and the chick meat and the organs such as the intestine kidney liver lung udder spleen these are the component which can be utilized for the production of the pet food other than that blood can be incorporated in the pet food in the form of uh, protein enhancer or as binder other than that some other vegetable components are also utilized for the preparation of pet food along with this uh, slaughterhouse by products some important pet food components those are the meat meal that is the whole tissue but excluding who blood who hair horn high trimmings the manure and the stomach etc they are the main component utilized in the production of the feed of different uh, non ruminant animal mainly and other than that the digest that is uh, there is the material from the mammals which result from the heat or the enzymatic or chemical breakdown of the clean meat tissue and or the part of meat is used as a flavor enhancing component in the pet food protein of the slaughterhouse the i told you already as all these material are animal generated or animal component and in part of the animal body that's why they contain huge amount of the protein but we generally do not use them and throw them away without adding any value therefore this protein can be extracted properly and they can be utilized for the uh, uh, addition of the value to the pet food even or some uh, can be added to the human food chain also but only after proper processing only they can be utilized so that any kind of contamination of the microbes or any kind of harmful material should be removed before their application to the human food chain biologically most of them are non carcass material and appropriate after appropriate cleaning and handling and processing they can be utilized and most of the by products have similar kind of protein content uh, that having in meat it has been shown that the protein recovered from the byproducts or even meat processing waste water is often uh, a high quality often ha have a high quality and, ha and has good functional properties of into them these you can see different kind of um, animal byproduct and what is the protein content and different amino acid composition of there it is being shown in this slide now value addition to the slaughterhouse byproduct the byproduct from the animal processing are widely converted into protein isolate and hydrolysate. These protein isolate and hydrolysate are in huge demand of today's nutrition uh, aware consumer population because of their health consciousness. This uh, such added value can uh, can be obtained in the term of improved shelf stability of the product, improved technological function like flavoring compounds, water binding agent and emulsifiers are there. Better sensory quality of the product can be obtained by the application of this byproduct in the term in the form of color detection and the flavor of the product. They are more convenient to use and bioactive peptides can be obtained from them like antioxidant and antimicrobial activities are there. Therefore, in the form of nutraceuticals, in the form of medicine, this can be uh, added to the diet of today's consumer.
Now that is gelatin and the utilization. Gelatin is the water soluble animal protein produced from the hydrolysis of the collagen. Mainly the skin, bone and the tendons and the osein are the major component where from the gelatin can be extracted. This is utilized for stabilizer in ice cream preparation and it has good gel forming ability. Therefore, in the desert, candies, bakery, in jellied meat, ice cream and the dairy product preparation, this gelatin is being utilized. Carcass fat, that is the carcass fat. I told you already, this is having different application other than that oleoresin industries. It can be incorporated in the human food even to increase the uh, value of the product in the form of uh, different essential fatty acid supplement. Now, animal fat are in uh, human food chain also, it has been incorporated. Like it can insert specific flavor to the product and therefore it is having, that's why because uh, it's having flavor enhancing properties of the bovine fat. That's why bovine fat are used as a frying agent in different food industry uh, application. Traditionally, it has used uh, it is used in the bread or the pastry making to assist the leavening process and softening the crumb of the bread. So these are the different application of uh, different byproducts. You can see uh, means normally if we uh, throw them out, we cannot extract the proper value by application of small steps. By application of easy processes, we can add extra value to our byproducts so that different industrial raw material candies uh, supplied from uh, our home itself. Know. Suppose three, four animals we are having. We are not applying them, only just throwing to the garbages. This is not the matter how we have to treat. Nowadays, people are getting aware and a lot of information are available everywhere. So we have to be very much careful to utilize this kind of byproduct to increase our profit uh, of animal rearing. So thank you very much from the, uh, from my side. So any queries regarding this, you can uh, just place in front of me. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for your uh, very exhaustive and nice presentation. Uh, you have covered all the topics uh, regarding uh, utilization of slaughterhouse waste, and uh, it was a very uh, informative presentation. Thank you, sir. So any question from the participants, uh, you, you can you, you can ask directly to the sir, or you can write your questions in the chat box. So, if you have any query, uh, you can ask. And any question? Thank you for a uh, nice presentation, Dr. Subhan. Yes, sir. Oh. Thank you, sir. So, any question? I think, sir, you have covered all all the all the topics uh, starting from the uh, uh, what we uh, call as basic to the uh, biotechnical level also. So uh, means uh, even the uh, whatever the new trends are there, how we can utilize. So that also you have covered, sir. One question is there, like uh, somebody is asking, what should be the concentration of S2SO4 which can be used to preserve the blood? Actually, uh, if means what means if there are some impurity, first of first the thing which we have to uh, take care of that the minimum amount of the adulteration from the outside should be admixed with the blood, and very minimum quantity of uh, acid can be utilized. Around one to two percent is much sufficient, and it can be increased up to two two to two point five percent also. But it depends upon what the level of uh, contamination in the blood is there. So if it is highly uh, purified form, it has been collected very uh, sophisticatedly, the amount of uh, acid is uh, lesser. Thank you, sir. So any other question? Anyone else? Okay, so I think there is uh, no more question. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, you have accepted our uh, invitation within a very short period of time. I think two days back only we have uh, uh, have invited you. So thank you, sir. Now I will request uh, Dr. Jende, sir, please to uh, give thanks to Dr. Suman, sir. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Suman. Uh, other participants are first of all requested don't uh, leave uh, the meeting. Uh, just wait for five to uh, ten minutes. 
we have to have declare some of the important uh, points by the dr vivek and dr vaidya sir okay so the i thank you uh, dr suman for presenting very nicely covering all the concept of the how this uh, slaughterhouse waste can be economically utilized and make our slaughterhouse uh, our integrated slaughterhouse more profitable okay because the, as you know that uh, except the last crop the animal everything can be utilized very Uh, scientifically and economically, so that we can uh, develop or we can get more profit out of that, and we can take care of the all overheads which are mainly required in the meat processing plant, slaughterhouse, and we can run very good business. Okay, so this model you are presented very nicely, excellent presentation, and uh, once again, thank you so much for accepting eleventh uh, hourly our invitation and uh, presenting the excellent presentation. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Suman, and all the best for your future. Again, uh, first time we are meeting online. Uh, I, yes. have seen, I haven't seen uh, in very co other conferences, and I have not even visited IVRI so far. So that could be the reason because we couldn't see. But uh, excellent, uh, you are knowledgeable and uh, very very good research person. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. So thank you from my side also, sir, uh, to recalling me and give me the given me the chance to uh, express my thought and uh, means whatever I know a little bit in front of you. So thank you very much, and uh, you are all are invited to IVRI doors are always open, open heartedly we are inviting you. Yes, yes. And I will very start doing the uh, Vivek Swagwa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely. We'll be waiting for you, your visit you, to IVRI, sir. sir. You will. thank you thank you actually thank you, the important you. thing is that within one or two days means <laughs> you have accepted uh, our uh, invitation and you have presented very excellent presentation so that's why thank you so much thank you very much to all of you thank you jinder so, sir uh, thank you dr vivek uh, before uh, the announcement is that we have we have sent the link of uh, the post evaluation uh, training pro forma so all participants are requested to Fill up the post evaluation training pro forma, and uh, another is the feedback form. So that also we will share in the WhatsApp group, and here also we have shared the link in the chat box. So all participants are requested to fill up the post evaluation pro forma as well as the feedback form. And feedback form you have to fill up; it's compulsory to get the certificate. Everyone's. Uh, uh that evaluation pro forma form and feedback form are mandatory so all are requested please fill up the uh, uh, these both the forms the another important thing is that now uh, coming to the validatory functions so we will give chance to one or two participants to speak for the uh, in this validatory function so i request our uh, about their experiences Uh, in this uh, 10 days training program so now first i will request our uh, course director dr arj jhende sir to pl uh, please uh, say few words uh, about this uh, training program yes jhende sir please yes. uh, thank you uh, dr vaidya uh, at the outset uh, i thank uh, from bottom of my heart for uh, all the participants who are joining every day Uh, this is uh, 17 january 2022 to till date and uh, very enthusiastically and alertly you, you are attending attended all the uh, topics which are delivered from the first to 10th day so we have covered maximum to be given to you all and uh, many more uh, training programs will be we are uh, organized here after also for the benefit of the all the participants from the academia from the industry from the, the some of the ngos and the own entrepreneurs also okay so you can every time any time you can just uh, communicate with us we have our separate uh, website also we have our own uh, telephone numbers mobile numbers on our website Dr. Vaidya is there. He is uh, organizing secretary. Dr. Vivek Shukla is also the organizing secretary. You can contact us any of for your any queries regarding your academia or any uh, 
industry problems okay food safety related problems are there okay so we are here to help you out so in uh, coming future also the, we'll be organizing uh, the different uh, topics also right from the for the especially for the students those who are studying in the colleges okay for the post graduate and the phd degree program okay for there also in uh, i think uh, another 15 or 20 days we are organizing one international uh, training program okay with the uh, hell in collaboration with the icmsf the international commission on the microbial uh, safety so the, the foreign uh, speakers and some of the speakers from our country also so those uh, will be speaking on the what are the microbial standards criteria guidelines which are mainly used in uh, various uh, industries for the domestic as well as export purpose so how to how this micro standards guidelines criteria they are determined their calculation part statistic part okay what are the parameters those who are being discussed okay so on the detail part we'll be taking that uh, training programs for i think two or three days so that also you have to attain that that uh, training program the voucher and everything i think uh, dr vaidya is in uh, process of finalizing that Okay, that will be communicated on the same same link will be kept uh, that what what of the whatsapp group which has been formed by our center so on that also the, we are not deleting that group okay it will be remain as it is so any future trading programs will be communicated through this group also okay and uh, i think uh, all the people like students faculty and uh, industry personnel they might have got uh, this the recent uh, latest uh, what are the informations which are related with the topics which are may be covered for this 10 days uh, and uh, definitely you will be utilizing that information in your day to day activities what you are doing at your places if it is student if it is industry person or the faculties okay so that that is i think uh, definitely it is helpful and our center has also our team of uh, organizing committee they have also prepared one uh, uh, a question at time it is very generalized okay what how 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 uh, you are benefited by uh, attending this 10 days training program so that is just evaluation so that the evaluation is not the pass and fail okay it is just for our understanding how much you are gained from this 10 days what are the efforts taken by dr vaidya and dr uh vivek so that will be and other uh, committee members of our nahib and uh, this is just uh, i and it will also help us uh, to to just uh, modernize or develop certain other training uh, modules okay which will be very easy to understand by the participants of the diverse group okay so so that for that purpose also this will be helping us uh, and and we are also asking one i think uh, dr vaidya will uh, circulate you this format okay that feedback and this uh, form of evaluation that it is very compulsorily you have to just write it will take i think two to three minutes or five minutes maximum okay so you have spend this two hours per day so ten, that is uh, 20 hours you have spent for this training program so only five minutes you have to spend it uh, write down that feedback and this form for the evaluation so that it will come to us then uh, we we can uh, start issuing the certificate of participation to you all okay so with this uh, uh, word i i uh, stop my uh, presentation okay and uh, discussion it is over thank you very much sir actually uh, to call the university authorities for this validatory functions hey. so all the university authorities hey, hey. they are busy in important meetings hey, hey. so now hey, hey. after uh, this uh, gender sir talk i invite hey, hey. and i request hey, hey. one or two participants those who want to share their experiences uh, during this training program so i request please you can uh, tell your name and you can say few words
Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. This is Dr. Shantri Jai Shankar Lingya Goda here. Yeah, the, yes, sir. The, the program was quite excellent. It is quite educative. See, it is also spreading the, the in-depth knowledge of the, the food animal uh, origin, uh, yeah, animal origin food. So it is quite uh, rather uh, educative and as well quite informative. And uh, a lot of uh, input is being given by the the organizing uh, authority. Anyway, thanks for uh, thanks a lot for this. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, kind words. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Now we have already uh, uh, given the feedback form, but anyone wants to say some if if they can give suggestions also for further improvement. So they can also uh, say a few words here. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Please. Yeah, it's Om Prakash Patil. Uh, uh, nothing special, but sir, just want to thanks from day one. The, you guys uh, uh, organized such a wonderful training session. And this uh, outcome from this today's training is, uh, I, I don't have words to say anything. But yes, uh, it's uh, like... N number of things uh, I captured from this 10 days training session, especially that today's uh, training, like legal things, the sir said that global things and FSSI, uh, Codex Elementary Standards, sir has expressed lots of importance training they have given. Uh, just want to thank everyone for organizing such a training, uh, wonderful training. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Om Prakash, sir. Okay, so uh, now uh, for the PPTs, uh, because many participants uh, in WhatsApp group, they ask the PPTs. So what we have done, we have uploaded the uh, PPTs in that video on our uh, websites naip website naip cast mapsu uh, website is there you can search on google so you will get the videos of our all the ppts 10 days uh, ppts now uh, coming to the uh, the uh, the end of this training program so for this training uh, many people have helped us a lot first of all i would like to thank Dr. R.C. Agrawal, sir, he is uh, National Director NAHEP ICR for funding this prestigious NAHEP project, as well as uh, Dr. Prabhat Kumar, sir, National Coordinator NAHEP. Then I, I, uh, I would like to thank our uh, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, Dr. A.M. Patruka, sir, who is always uh, gu guiding us and he is always support, cooperation uh, is uh, there. So I thank Patruka sir also. Then I thank the, our DI and Dean, Dr. Sirish Upadhyay sir, for constant inspiration, moral support, and encouragement. Then I thank our uh, University Director of Research, Dr. N. V. Kurkure sir, Dr. Bhikane sir, Dr. P. G. Vasnik sir, then uh, our University Registrar, Controller Madam. Then I thank to, uh, thanks to all the Associate Deans of the Constituent Colleges and all university authorities uh, for their support, help, and kind, kind cooperations. I thank our beloved associate dean, then uh, Dr. R.J. Jhende, sir, PI, both are the course directors of this training program for their constant support, cooperation, and encouragement for organizing such wonderful event. Then important thing is that I thank all the participants because of only you only this program has successful. Uh, uh, that's why and uh, your suggestion, your uh, whatever questions and answer sessions are very much helpful to us for the improvement. So I thank all the participants you have participated across the country from different organizations, different industries. So your participation is very important. I thank all of you. Then I thank the organizing sec uh, secretary, uh, Dr. Vivek Shukla, 
who has taken lot of efforts for organizing uh, this event. I thank all the uh, co-PIs of this NAHI project. I thank all the uh, the uh, project staff and our uh, Mumbai Veterinary College staff for helping this uh, this organization of this program and all these uh, the NAHI project staff. So they have taken a lot of efforts for organizing this event. Last but not the least, I appreciate the efforts taken by our VPA team as well as our college team and team of NAHEP, all the staff members and the students also they involved for organizing the event. And I thank all of them for making this our 10 days staggering program grand success. Thank you one and all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.